Uh, all right, guys. So uh, we are really happy to have uh, managed to wake Slil up in the West Coast. <laughs> and uh, she is at Stanford. She'll tell us about the yeah, remarkable power of linear programs. Yeah, go. Great. OK, yeah, thank you so much for, for inviting me. And thank you, everyone, for showing up. Uh, I like to see people's faces when I'm talking. So if you don't mind turning your camera on, I really appreciate it. Um, thanks. So right. So today, I'll tell you about approximating, approximating maximum cut with sub-exponential linear programs. Uh, this is based on two separate uh, papers, one joint work with Ryan O'Donnell at CMU, and then another joint work with Sam Hopkins at Berkeley and Luca Trevisan at Bocconi. So let's uh, let's get started. Okay, so our uh, our kind of a uh, problem of primary interest will be the maximum cut problem. So in this problem, I get uh, as input a graph with n vertices and m edges, and uh, my goal is to output the maximum fraction of edges cut by any partition of the vertices into two sets. So. Uh, for example, in this little graph here on the left, uh, the, the maximum cut partition is this one. Uh, and I can think of this as, as trying to assign labels to every vertex, either plus or minus one, so that the maximum number of edges have different labels assigned to the endpoints. And uh, it's not too difficult to formulate this as a polynomial optimization problem, right? So uh, in this polynomial optimization problem, my variables are uh, x1 through xn. I require them to be signs, either plus or minus one. Okay, and then in this way, I can encode the fraction of uh, edges cut by the assignment uh, of, of these variables to plus or minus one, because uh, here I'm taking a sum over edges. Uh, and then here, this, this function is one if the edge is cut and uh, zero if it's not cut. Okay, so, so uh, this is a, a formulation we'll see uh, from time to time. And uh, computing maximum cut is an NP-hard problem. So I shouldn't expect to have an efficient algorithm for uh, this question. Uh, but, but in this talk, we'll be interested in the question of approximation for maximum cut. So can we approximate the maximum cut value well? OK, so now, now here are a bunch of the kind of like a typical bag of tricks that, that people use when, when they're trying to optimize a polynomial optimization problem, right? So the first, the first uh, trick is that instead of trying to optimize this polynomial optimization problem, which is uh, some quadratic function over the hypercube, uh, a discrete uh, non-convex set, you can say, okay, instead, I want to do a simpler kind of optimization. So I'm going to optimize instead a linear function over a convex set, uh, right? And, and uh, in this case, uh, what you can do is you can, you can uh, relax from uh, the, the hypercube to the cut polytope, right? So that's um, this set here. So, so what I do is uh, instead of uh, optimizing over uh, n-dimensional hypercube, I go to uh, the set of reals and, uh, and choose two or uh, n-squared dimensions, however you want. And I optimize a linear function, which is the quadratic form of a vector in the cut polytope with the adjacency matrix. So here you can think of this as the adjacency matrix of the graph uh, stretched out into an n choose two dimensional vector. Okay, so, so this, this was my first uh, trick, but uh, it's, it's not gonna work because computing max cut is still NB hard, right? So I can't expect that this will have given me a better algorithm. Uh, still optimization over the cut polytope gives me an exact solution. Okay, so so now this is a, this is a, when I'm going to do something that's actually going to be uh, helpful. So instead of optimizing over this complicated set, the cut polytope, which which is complicated in that it has a large description, like it has uh, many. Uh, in order to describe it, I need many inequalities. It has many vertices and facets. What I'm going to do is I'm going to instead relax to optimize over a simpler set. Okay, so what, when we do these relaxations, uh, where we typically go to a nicer set in that it has a simpler description, uh, it will be convex. And sometimes we, we go to higher dimensions. So, so what we do is we take our, our set and, and we lift it so that the 
uh, original set is, is just a projection of that set into a lower dimensional space. So I, I, here I tried to, to show this because uh, this, this polytope is supposedly in two dimensions as we see it, but the sphere is actually in three dimensions. If we project down into the uh, plane, then, then we have our simpler set. Okay, and then uh, when we do this relaxation, inherently we, we lose accuracy, right? So uh, in, in this picture here, I'm, I'm thinking of optimizing the linear function, which is the projection onto the direction C. After I do the relaxation, I still want to optimize in the direction of the projection onto C, uh, but as you can see, the, the value will have perhaps increased, right? Because there, there could be a point in the relaxation uh, which has a higher correlation, let's see. Uh, okay, so, so when we do this relaxation, inherently we're, we're accepting some approximation, but, but hey, that's still good enough for us. So uh, one thing that we automatically get is that the value of the optimization problem over a relaxation is an upper bound on the value for the maximum cut problem, right? So, so that's cool. We get to compute uh, upper bounds on, on the value. Uh, and then the second thing we can do sometimes is we can produce a solution to the maximum cut problem, say, uh, of the, that approximates the, the maximum uh, cut solution by taking the solution over the convex set and then rounding it down back to an actual solution to the maximum cut problem or whichever other problem. Okay, so our goal is to understand uh, approximation quality as a function of our relaxation's complexity. Cool. I guess I guess if there's if there are questions, it's a good, it's a good time for them right here uh, about the general setup. But okay, hopefully there. Just interrupt me anytime. Uh, okay, so so some popular convex relaxations. I, I guess uh, the the only really uh, uh, well understood convex relaxations are are first of all linear programming, right? So here uh, this is just effectively optimizing over a polytope, um, a linear function over a polytope. And uh, the second is semi-definite programming in which I take the, the intersection of a bunch of uh, affine constraints with the positive semi-definite cone, right? So here my variables are uh, actually like uh, matrices in R n by n, and I require that as a matrix, it has no uh, negative eigenvalues. Right, so this is th these and and, and uh, I can enforce these constraints in polynomial time. This is why uh, semi-definite programming, I guess, is, is interesting to us. So okay, so these are kind of the two uh, uh, popular families of convex relaxation, and our measure of complexity is going to be the size. Right, so the size here is the uh, the dimension plus the number of linear constraints that uh, I'm adding in order to define the convex set that I'm working in. Right, and this is a yeah. Yeah, sometimes the number of constraints is not really the right uh, the right complexity measure if you have uh, say a separation oracle for your uh, for your set. Then you don't care sometimes if you have even exponentially many constraints. If you right, if you have a separation oracle, you don't have to worry so much about the number. Of That's right. That's right. Yeah, but I guess this is a, a reasonable uh, generic. Uh, yeah. generic uh, measure of complexity but indeed like you know for some problems the the um number of constraints is not uh faithfully capturing the the complexity of algorithms for for the problem like uh, for matching for example yeah it's one good example uh but i mean okay i guess it's getting getting to abby's point uh like one reason that this might be a reasonable uh measure of complexity is that if we just want to run a black box optimization method without any additional cleverness, then uh, there exists black box optimization methods which run in time that's polynomial in this notion of size. So sometimes you can uh, get around this and, and do even better uh, with your optimization methods, but if, if we just want to run an optimization method as black box, the size is a reasonable notion of complexity. 
Well, I guess uh, the, if you have a separation oracle, then the same black box method will work. Yes. Uh, but uh, anyway, yeah, I won't get clearly you don't have a good uh, separation yeah. oracle for what you're going to. Yeah, so generically, it's, uh, yeah, that's the only reasonable uh, measure of size. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I guess that I guess that one uh, sort of uh, other measure, which okay, maybe I, I shouldn't uh, shouldn't even uh, get into this, but let me just let me just say that um, you could say that you want to understand the size of the smallest, like you're willing to take a relaxation into not too many dimensions, and then you want to understand the size of the smallest relaxation whose projection gives you back your original set. So this is like the extension complexity. Uh, and this is an even more maybe a generic uh, measure. Right. Uh, OK. So in any case, so, so these are kind of the two uh, popular uh, convex relaxations that, that uh, we work with. Uh, I guess uh, Cynthia is, is in the audience. So uh, uh, Cynthia knows well that there's also other reasonable uh, types of relaxations like hyperbolic programs, but I guess those are less well understood from, from a kind of a approximation uh, perspective. So anyway, these will be the, the kind of relaxations that we, we work with today. Okay, and what we want to do is we want to understand uh, approximation quality as a function of relaxation size. And specifically what we want to do is we want to compare the power of linear programs with semi-definite programs. Uh, and generally, there's a very dramatic separation between the power of, of these two sets uh, or, or these two types of programs. So uh, here is a, a theorem uh, by Braun, Fiorini, Pukuta, and Sawyer. So the theorem says that there is a polynomial sized semi-definite programming optimization problem. So, so there's a polynomial sized spectrohedron in, in n dimensions, uh, such that any linear program or any polytope which gets a linear uh, or which gets a constant factor approximation requires exponential size. So in order to capture a spectrohedron, you need uh, exponentially many facets uh, in your in your polytope. Okay, so, so this this is not so surprising if you think about it because uh, like the, the spectrohedron is is round, <laughs> so we should need a lot of, of facets to approximate it well. Um, but but here this this theorem formalizes that we can't get constant factor approximation uh, unless we have exponential size. Okay, and uh, and the question that that's we sort of set out to answer in these works is: Is there a similarly dramatic separation for maximum cut and other combinatorial optimization problems? Okay, so let me give you a brief history of convex relaxations for max cut. So in general, we say that uh, relaxation R obtains an alpha approximation for a maximization problem if the value uh, over R is at most uh, an alpha factor times the optimum value over the original uh, set. OK, so maximum cut has a trivial half approximation. So Okay, so so uh, and let me, let me say what it, what it is and then argue why. So remember that we start by optimizing over the cut polytope. Sorry, it's real. One question yeah. about the previous, if you don't mind. Uh, the previous slide or the previous. The previous slide. Yeah. So uh, is this result? Um, this is stronger than a typical extension complexity result. The way it's stated, it's uh, like it's it's giving a bound on the size of all LPs, not just like the left and project. No, this this should this should only be for, for this is only a this is only an extension complexity uh, statement. It's not stronger oh. than the typical one. Yeah, I just I just uh, I just wrote the theorem in a, a sort of imprecise way so that it would be so you wouldn't have to know the definitions of extension complexity yeah, yeah. to sort of understand what's going on. The, the reasoning you give seems to seems to work for any LP basically. Uh, or no, seems no, to be, yeah, but uh, yeah, okay, thanks anyway. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so okay, so so okay, so here I am convincing you that maximum cut has a trivial half approximation. 
Right. And um, the way that you do this is you you start by optimizing over the cut polytope, and instead you relax to have a, a n squared dimensional cube. So basically, here I'm instead of optimizing over this cut polytope, I'm optimizing over the space of matrices whose uh, entries have uh, or are bounded in in value, I guess, by uh, upper bounded by one and lower bounded by zero. So it's a very it's a very simple set. And uh, it's not difficult to convince yourself that the value over this set is going to be one. So value is equal to one. But the whole point is that the value one is already a half approximation for max cut. And in order to convince yourself of this, you can see that uh, if you output a random cut, every edge is going to be cut with probability half. So the expected value of a random cut is half. Uh, therefore, there has to exist a cut of value at least have. Um, so, so already by taking this like very, you know, simple, just bunch of uh, parallel uh, half spaces, we, we get a, a half approximation. Okay, so, so, okay, so it's good to know that this happens, that that was a little bit anticlimactic. Um, and I guess for a long time, uh, when I was, I guess I, I wasn't around for most of it, but, but uh, for a long time, it seemed like half was the best that you could do for maximum cut. But then uh, in the early 90s, Delorme and Poliak proposed, and then Gomez and Williams analyzed this beautiful uh, spectrohedral approximation, where again, you start with a cut polytope, but now instead you, you relax to uh, what is now referred to as the basic semi definite program. Uh, and basically, what's done here is that uh, instead of looking at uh, matrices of the form, uh, like in the cut polytope, we're looking at the all ones matrix minus the quadratic form of a rank one uh, sine vector. Here we're looking at the all ones matrix minus a positive semi definite matrix whose diagonal entries are bounded by one. Okay, so uh, I guess maybe it doesn't matter so much to, to absorb uh, this, this specific uh, details of this relaxation, but when you use this pretty uh, elegant semi definite program, Gomez and Williams improved that. Uh, this gives a 0.878 approximation, so so dramatically better than this uh, half approximation given by this uh, very simple cube relaxation. Okay, and then uh, perhaps uh, surprisingly, it turns out that uh, any better polynomial size approximation would refute the unique games conjecture, which is a conjecture that um, we may or may not believe to be true. But but anyway, uh, making progress on this uh, would would uh, dramatically change the, the landscape of uh, the hardness of approximation. So, so this is, this is uh, essentially it for maximum cut. This is the state of the art. Well, what does this Delorme and Poliak paper do? So Delorme and Poliak, they introduce this semi-definite program, right? So they say, this is, a, this is a program that maybe we should analyze. And then I, I, I believe they also uh, analyze it in some specific uh, cases. Um, but not not in general. Cool, thanks. <laughs> okay, so this is this uh, this uh, summarizes uh, what's true for convex relaxations and max cut. But another thing that was happening is that people were analyzing the performance of uh, linear programs and polytopes. Okay, and and what it seemed like is it seemed like the value a half was kind of like a firm. Uh, barrier for how well a polytope could do in approximating maximum cut. So uh, I'll say a little bit more about this later, a little bit more precisely. But the following uh, theorem, which is actually a combination of two theorems um, proven about a decade apart, uh, says that for every epsilon, there exists a delta such that no linear program of size 2 to the n to the delta, so sub-exponential in n, can achieve an approximation better than half plus epsilon. Okay, so this is saying uh, if I want to get approximation better than half, then provably I need to take a linear program of at least sub exponential size. Uh, this is at least if I don't want a linear program whose, whose constraints will depend specifically on the graph, because obviously if for any uh, specific instance of maximum cut, you can just you know put a hyperplane that gets you exactly the value. So this is this is but this is just some some uh, technicality for. Um, or not, it's an important technical point, but it is a technical point nonetheless. 
Okay, so, so linear programs uh, seem stuck at a half approximation. Um, and and so this this just brings me basically to the to the punchline of the talk, which is that actually uh, linear programs of sub-exponential size can approximate maximum cut. So this is a this is a I think pretty surprising uh, result. I think uh, many many experts also uh, felt surprised. So okay, so here's the the main sort of theorem. So here we say that for every delta there exists some epsilon such that the degree n to the delta Shirali Adams LP, which is an LP of size two to the n to the delta, so sub-exponential in n, uh, that linear program will obtain a half plus epsilon approximation to maximum cut. Okay, so this is saying that it, yeah. Will you tell us the relation between epsilon and delta in the lower and in the upper bound? I will, uh, it's right here. So, okay, so, uh, so right, so 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 I mean I guess the the like qualitatively, the main point is that sub-exponential size linear programs do provide non-trivial approximations to maximum cut. Of course, the approximation factor that we're able to prove is uh, not very strong. I mean, epsilon is very small as a as a function of delta, uh, but still, for for delta not depending on the uh, size of the graph, we get an epsilon that doesn't depend on the size of the graph, which is I think uh, pretty amazing. Uh, however, this this does not come anywhere close to to matching the performance of the semi-definite program. So, um, you know, the Gomez Williamson or Delorme Poirier relaxation is still winning by a lot. And uh, what is the relation in the low bound? So uh, the relation, okay, so the relation in the lower bound um, is not this bad, but. Uh, the lower bound comes from random graphs, and we do have a tighter result for random graphs that matches the the lower bound up to the big O factor. Um, so I guess I'll say a little bit more about okay. this later, but but okay. we are we are tight against the lower bound, but but via different analysis. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so so another another bonus is that uh, in graphs that have a specific structure, so if the graph has bounded threshold rank, this basically means that uh, if I take the random walk matrix or the transition matrix for the random walk on the graph and I look at its uh, number of eigenvalues that are larger than some some threshold tau, uh, there aren't too many of them. So in graphs that don't have too many eigenvalues, bigger than one over n to the let's say 0.5, there's actually a polynomial sized linear program which gets a 0.999 approximation to maximum cut. So so I guess that if you if you want to think about it like you know here here we have a very complicated object that's that's the cut polytope, right? Um, but if I if I look at optimizing over directions which correspond to graphs of bounded uh, uh, threshold rank, then actually we can get a pretty simple polytope that is tight in those directions against the uh, cut poly polytope. Um, and by here pretty simple, I mean only need polynomial many constraints in order to define it. Yeah, but still the polytope does not depend on the on the graph. It's just that uh, some some vertices of the cut polytope will be closer to your polytope. Right, right, yeah. right. Uh, uh, Tzlil, can you compare this the second theorem to um, this uh, like the freeze Kannon algorithmic regularity um, approximation for max cut um, for max cut on graphs with low threshold rank you would get um like that is that like not uh yeah I, I guess that's probably not an lp yeah not that uh i certainly don't know how to compare it off the top of my head but it sounds very good so maybe we can think about it sure yeah yeah just curious yeah um okay cool so uh Another thing is that the so I, I presented so far only in terms of maximum cut, but actually this approach 
is uh, more general and it works for some additional discrete optimization problems. So uh, for those of you who know the unique games problem, uh, uh, great. For those of you who don't know the unique games problem, just think of it as a, a very specific version of, of graph coloring. Um, so here we have a qualitatively similar result for unique games. We say that uh, for every delta, there exists an epsilon such that uh, for unique games on an alphabet sigma, a degree n to the delta times logarithmic in sigma Shirley Adams relaxation. So this is a, a Shirley Adams uh, relaxation of size two to the, or I guess uh, size sigma to the uh, n to the delta. Um, distinguishes between instances of value close to one and uh, instances of value at most epsilon. Right, so, so this is again uh, qualitatively similar to the semi-definite programming based algorithms for unique games that were known in the past. Uh, of course, our, our epsilon uh, is, is very, very small compared to what is achieved by these, these prior works. But I think it does demonstrate that uh, this approach is, is not you know, special to maximum cut and actually uh, is true for, for other uh, discrete optimization problems. And we have similar results for other two CSPs as well. Okay, so I guess the, you know, the bottom line is that, that kind of uh, surprisingly for, for many combinatorial optimization problems, linear programs can give non-trivial approximations. Okay, so now let me, let me tell you a little bit more about the background, uh, just in order to maybe convince you how surprising uh, this, this result should be. Um, I, uh, yeah, so, but, you know, of course, feel free to stop me whenever you want to. Okay, so as I mentioned before, in, in 95, Gomez and Williamson showed that 0.878 uh, approximation for max cut using semi-definite program. Um, but in parallel, we have these lower bounds against linear programming hierarchies. Okay, and I'll say in a moment what a linear programming hierarchy is, uh, but um, in uh, 2006, we had a result that showed that exponential size low bus driver linear programs fail. Okay, so here this is a lower bound against uh, exponential size linear programs of a certain class. Uh, and then in 2007, De La Vega and Matthew showed that polynomial size Shirley Adams LP can't get approximation factors better than let's say 0.51. Um, and, and here I'm going to give you a, a qualitative uh, description of what a linear programming hierarchy is. Um, so, so uh, let's look at the, at the Shirley Adams linear programming hierarchy, even though this, is, this applies just as well to the Lovas driver uh, LP. So, so in these LP relaxations, we can think of starting with some very basic LP relaxation. Like this is like the n squared dimensional cube that I was mentioning before. So, so some, something basic. And then the linear programming hierarchy gives us a way to systematically uh, strengthen this basic relaxation. So, uh, if at the bottom step we have a relaxation of size n, at the second rung we have a relaxation of size n squared, so with, with n squared constraints and uh, variables. Um, you know, and, and formulaically we can add more and more constraints until at the very top we are given back exactly the cut polytope. Right, so, so this is some, some systematic way to interpolate between a very crude uh, linear programming relaxation and a uh, completely tight uh, relaxation at the top. So um, yeah, and I guess uh, uh, later I'll tell you more precisely what the Shirali had on this relaxation does, but, but for now, uh, this is the kind of picture you should have in mind. So, uh, and also I'll, I'll denote the dth level Shirali Adams relaxation by SA sub D of the graph and keep in mind that this has size and to the D. So more precisely, what De La Vega and Matthew showed is that for every epsilon and uh, for every fixed integer, there's a sequence of graphs uh, of size uh, n uh, for, for any n, such that the Shirley Adams value of the graph is at most uh, half plus epsilon. Uh, and then in 2009, Charikar, McCarthy, Kevin Chin, McCarthy showed that for every epsilon, there exists a delta and a sequence of graphs such that the Shirley Adams relaxation of uh, degree or level into the delta also has value the most half plus epsilon. Okay, so, so these results are nice, but actually so far they only rule out 
a restricted class of linear programs, these Shirala Adams linear programs, uh, and the, the low bus driver LPs, like there's no reason to think that you couldn't get perhaps a better, tighter approximation. Uh, but then there's these remarkable results that came just a little bit later that, that sort of state that Shirali Adams is the most powerful linear programming relaxation that you can write down. So in 2012, Chen, Lee, Rogovan, and Sorter showed that uh, if there's a linear program of size at most n to the d with a ratio at least rho, then the Shirali Adams at level 2d, which has size n to the 2d, also has to have approximation ratio at least rho. Right, so, so basically this means that uh, paying only a quadratic blow up in the size of your relaxation, you can get an approximation that's just as good with this linear program. So in particular, any lower bound for Shirali atoms will also translate to a uh, lower bound on any polytope. Uh, and then, and, and so the, the one caveat here is that uh, this result was only for polynomial sized linear program. So it, it wasn't enough to uh, kind of capture the Charkov, Makarchev, and Karchev uh, results. Okay, but then in 2017, Kutari, Mecca, and Rogavendra upgraded this and actually uh, managed to show a similar statement for any size uh, linear program. And, and the conclusion of all of this is that no linear program of size smaller than 2 to the n to the 0.01 can approximate max pet better than 0.51. Uh, but also, it wasn't clear that these lower bounds that were proven by Charkar, Makarchev, and Makarchev were the best possible lower bounds for uh, these. Like, it seemed very believable that actually uh, these results of uh, Schoenbeck, Tulsiani, and Trevisan for this weaker, low bus driver linear programming hierarchy could be uh, the correct answer. And actually, you needed exponential size Shirali Adams LPs in order to get good approximations. Okay, this is actually what we believed when we started working on this problem, right? We believed uh, we're gonna come in and we're going to use some, some fancy new technology for proving lower bounds. And we're going to actually get uh, exponential size lower bounds for any linear program uh, for max path. Um, okay, and then uh, the plot twist is that Instead, we sort of showed the opposite. So in a, in a paper with Ryan O'Donnell in 2019, uh, we showed that if we're in the situation where uh, we are given a graph and the graph is, is uh, spectrally bounded, meaning I take the transition matrix for the random walk and I look at all of the eigenvalues except for the, the first kind of trivial uh, stationary eigenvalue. And I promise you that those eigenvalues are all bounded in magnitude by something like uh, one over uh, root delta. So this this choice was made to capture, for example, like uh, delta Ramanujan graphs. Um, okay, so in this situation, then uh, degree uh, exponential in log n over log delta level, Shirley Adams LP will get approximation ratio like this. So, so uh, rather than absorbing the specific uh, relationship between these parameters, let me give you a, a specific example. So uh, let's say, that uh, we're given a random delta regular graph, then with high probability, it will satisfy this uh, eigenvalue boundedness constraint. Uh, I guess I, I would need a, a minus one here, but, uh, but uh, give me this uh, constant difference. Okay, so, so, uh, so for example, if, if I give you a, a random graph uh, like GN one over N to the 0.99, then a constant level Shirley Adams relaxation will get a ratio close to one. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, in, in the case of random graphs, I guess the, the max cut value is, is very concentrated. So you could the guess is the point is that you certify the value you get here, right? I mean, you could you could not run any algorithm and just know what the value of the cut in a random graph is. Right. But here you certify it, certify it as well. That's right. Right, we're, with a linear program, we, we certify it, right? And this is, exactly, yeah. So it's not like these are interesting uh, instances of max cut, um, but still it's, it's true that we get a linear program that certifies an upper bound much better than one on the value. And I think even this, we didn't uh, 
didn't believe should be true. In fact, these random graphs were the lower bound instances used by Charkar, Makarchev, and Makarchev uh, previously. So, so these were also known to be hard for Shirali Adams uh, up to a certain degree. And here we show that actually those lower bounds were, are tight, right? So, so uh, if you take the Shirali Adams degree slightly larger, then you can get a, a good certificate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so this is this is this is uh, this is uh, this is already very surprising uh, to me, but um, it's true that these these graphs are not very. I mean, they don't have very large values of max max cut. Right, they're random graphs. Uh, no cut will cut much more than half of the edges. And so, uh, what what you'd want is you'd want to to say something about approximation rather than refutation. Um, and you know, like automatically, any graph that has a large maximum cut should have an eigenvalue that's close to negative one for the transition matrix, uh, just as witnessed by the cut vector that gets a uh, value close to one. And so, uh, we we want to know whether we can say something about uh, approximation rather than refutation or certification. Okay, so then, so then this this uh, result with uh, with uh, Sam Hopkins and Luca Trevisan, uh, we're able to take the ideas from the uh, certification result in in kind of pseudo random graphs and uh, upgrade this to an actual approximation result in any graph. So uh, you can think of this as, as a, a converse to this uh, lower bound of, of Charikar, Makarchik, and Karchev, uh, coupled with the result of Kutari, Raghavendra, and Mecca. So they say that no linear program of size at most 2 to the n to the 0.1 gets an approximation better than 0.51. And we say that there is an LP of size 2 to the n to the 0.01 that gets an approximation that's at least 0.5 plus you know, 2 to the negative 10 to the 6, which um, is very small, but it still doesn't depend on, on n. And uh, so it's a non-trivial approximation to maximum cut with linear program. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, and taking this uh, theorem also for the, not just max cut, but the uh, unit gains, uh, does it tell us anything uh, even more convincing about uh, unique games not being NP complete, or it's, it's sort of just the same as the, in this sense, the same as Aurora Barak Stoyer? It's, it's essentially the same as Aurora Barak Stoyer. If you, I guess that their dependence on the alphabet size in the degree is a little bit worse. But their approximation is much better. So it's like, yeah, I, I guess that qualitatively they're the same and quantitatively they're incomparable. Um, yeah. But I don't, so it doesn't, point, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the main point is really the separation of unique gains from SDPs in general. From, uh, right. Uh, well, where you, you do have, uh, you know, two to the end lower bounds. Right. Um, good. Yeah, so, uh, right, so this is, I guess this is the end of the sort of uh, introductory portion of the, of the talk. Um, oh, wow, I didn't realize how long it had been. But I, okay, so I guess we have about 20 minutes to, to talk about the proof, uh, if, if yeah, people if feel that it's time for that. Uh, yeah, we'll give you more. <laughs> oh, okay. If you attempt us. All right, well, I guess, uh, I guess, uh, Stop me if, if it gets to be too much. <laughs> okay, so right. So in, in the remaining time, um, I'll tell you about the proof. And I, so I made I made the slides for the proof a while ago, and then looking back at them in preparation for this talk, I was just I was horrified that I had ever given a presentation that was so technical to include all of the details in these slides. So I I really invite you to I'm I'm going to provide a like a commentary overlay. Um, and I invite you to ignore any parameters that, like any values of any parameters that you see, and hopefully the intuition will be will be uh, clear. But I, I apologize for the level of technicality of the slides um, in advance. There's also some next, some pictures, so so I invite you to focus on the pictures. Okay, so so the proof outline is like this. So there are sort of four steps, but 
I guess that we can only really take uh, credit for new ideas in one of the steps. So, so let me um, tell you all the steps and I'll highlight where the new ideas are. Okay, so I guess the first the first step is to even uh, define the Shirali Adams uh, polytope. This isn't really like a, a step of the proof per se, uh, but you know it's a very it's a very flexible definition. It's very nice, um, and it, that will enable us to reason about uh, its performance. Okay, and then uh, the second step is something called global correlation rounding. So this is a this is a condition under which you can use Shirali Adams in order to uh, get good approximation values. Uh, this is this is also uh, from prior work um, of uh, Barack uh, Regimendra and Storer. Okay, then, uh, in order to show that the global correlation rounding strategy works, you need something that's called a uh, local to global relationship, uh, local to global correlation lemma, right? So, so this is. This is, a, and, I'll, and I'll explain more about this later, but, but that's kind of what uh, our main contribution is. It's, it's a way to relate local and global correlation in linear programs. Um, so this is where kind of the, the new ideas uh, will come in, right? And, and I'll, I'll present how to do this in expanders, and then I'll talk a little bit about how one goes from expanders to worst case graphs, um, which again uses ideas that are uh, basically based on threshold decomposition of graphs, which also appeared in the prior literature. So, so really all the innovation is kind of in, in this step. Okay, so let me let me start by defining uh, Shirali Adams. So, uh, okay, so I want I want us all to think of Shirali, Shirali Adams as a linear programming relaxation, but I want us all to think about it as a, as a moment oracle. Okay, so here is my definition of what a moment oracle is. Suppose that I have some indeterminate X uh, that's supposed to live on the hypercube in n dimensions. So a degree d moment oracle is going to be any function from monomials of degree at most d to the reals. Uh, and I'll say that a moment oracle is truthful if it's consistent with the moment of some actual distribution d over the hypercube. Okay, so like for example, think of D as the distribution over maximum cuts, right? So if we if we had this oracle, then we could compute all the moments of the distribution over maximum cuts, and we'd be in great shape because we could round from it. But getting something like this is NP hard. So what does Shirley Adams give us? So the level D Shirley Adams relaxation is a degree D moment oracle, which is not truthful, but at least it's locally truthful, meaning that. For every subset of these n bits of size at most d, for d, the level of Shirley Adams that I'm considering, there is some specific distribution over those bits uh, which is consistent with this locally truthful oracle, right? So, okay, so I'm interested in, in the value of an n bit determinant or indeterminate, but what Shirley Adams gives me is if I focus on any d of those variables, and I, I throw out uh, what it says about all the other ones and I only look at those D, then there's some actual distribution that's consistent with them. Okay, so, so this is way weaker than having uh, a distribution which is, which is uh, uh, like defined on, on everything, but at least on every local D bits, uh, I, I have a, an, an oracle for uh, distribution on those. And, um, we can implement a degree D locally truthful oracle uh, with a linear program of size n to the order D. Okay, and the reason why you can see this is that uh, distribution over the bits in A is specified by the probability of the two to the A events of, you know, what value do those bits take, right? Uh, and, and I can encode this with uh, two to the A plus one linear constraints. Uh, so, so I have the, all the inequalities that the probabilities are non-negative plus the constraint that they sum to one. All right, so this is good. Um, so, and, uh, and now the variables of my linear program are going to be all the probabilities for these uh, n choose d distributions on each of the possible uh, subsets of d bits. 
Um, and I'll constrain them to have consistent marginals with each other, right? So the crucial thing is that uh, expectations are linear in probabilities. Okay, and then I'll, I'll also um, look for the uh, max cut objective to be maximized over the polytope defined by all of these uh, and choose the constraints times two to the D, I guess, plus one. Okay, so does this kind of make sense? All right. Uh, cool. So, so the, the TLDR from this slide is that uh, Shirley Adams uh, is a polytope of size uh, N choose D uh, or order uh, uh, N choose D. And that it, it defines for me these locally consistent uh, distributions over variable. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about global correlation rounding. So, uh, so now I, I want us to engage in a thought experiment, which is, okay, suppose that I gave you the moment oracle for an actual distribution over maximum cuts, but I only give you moments of degree up to 100, right? So, so okay, so I, I promise you this oracle. Now, how are you going to find a maximum cut from this? Okay, so let me let me uh, describe a very uh, very simple algorithm, which I'll call independent rounding. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample the labels of all of my uh, variables independently uh, with with marginals equal to the expectation under the distribution. Okay. So uh, okay. So this is obviously an algorithm. So let's let's analyze when will this give us a good cut. So whether or not this gives us a good cut depends on the correlation of the, of the bits, right? So, um, so let me define this quantity, the correlation, which is just going to be the absolute value of the uh, expectation of the product of bits uh, minus the product of the expectations. So my claim is that if the local correlation, meaning the expectation over edges in the graph of the correlation across those uh, edges is, is bounded by some small number eta, then independent rounding will give value that's close to the expected value uh, under this uh, distribution minus some small quantity uh, depending on eta. So, okay, the proof is just very simple. So. Let's, let's analyze the expected value of my simple algorithm. So uh, by the independence of my bits, it's just the, you know, the, I can just uh, move this expectation in here and replace with the, the um, moment oracle's uh, expectations. Okay, and then uh, I can separate this into, into the, I can, I can lower bound this by the objective minus the difference between uh, the, the correlated sample and the um, independent samples. Uh, and this is at least objective minus, minus a half uh, eta because you know, my assumption was that I have a bound on the local correlations. So here, uh, you know, nothing in the degree comes in. The analysis works for whatever the uh, the, the degree was giving you. What's uh, important about the degree one hundred or D is what A type provides. But this exactly. analysis is uh, completely general and depends just on the second moment. Exactly. I, I, I mean, in fact, okay. So this is this is a great point. So. Uh, it's not even the case that if I take D to be N, like if I give you a fully truthful moment oracle, uh, I will have this bounded local correlation property, right? So the thing is, is that um, like in maximum cuts, it's a great it's a great way to see this, right? Like maximum cut is completely symmetric in the labels of the vertices. I mean, if I take uh, the plus minus one solution and I multiply by minus one, uh, it still gives me a, a solution of exactly the same value. Okay, and so actually, I do expect to have correlation in any case, um, right? So, so uh, we can't expect bounded correlation in general, uh, but what we can do is we can reduce our correlation by conditioning. So, so in this in this example, it's very easy to see. Like, 
if I have only one unique maximum cut, so there's only one solution X, uh, I guess there never will be only one solution X because X and minus X will both be solutions. But once I fix the value of the first bit to be one, then there's only one unique solution. Okay, so this is like conditioning on the value of some bit. Uh, and, and there's a general recipe uh, for reducing the global correlation by conditioning. Okay, so so this is a, this is a, a beautiful, I think, uh, and very general framework introduced by Barak Ravendra and Stoyer, and then later developed a little bit more by Ravendra and Tan. But the idea is that um, so let's look at the global correlation, which is just going to be oh this is this is a bad typo. So this is just the expectation over i and j randomly sampled from the vertex set. Uh, so I just look at the at the correlation of two random vertices in the graph. Um, so this quantity we can always reduce by conditioning. So this is the theorem that we'll use. So suppose that we're given access to a moment oracle of degree at least uh, k, then you can get a moment oracle of degree d minus k, where the global correlation is bounded by order one over square root k. Uh, without changing the objective value or other properties of the distribution. So we start with degree D. Uh, now we go down to degree D minus K, but we've reduced the global correlation by a lot. Uh, and and this is this is uh, pretty nice because it means that you know as as long as uh, reducing the global correlation does something for the local correlation, my independent drowning algorithm will work. Okay, so right. So in the previous slide, we saw that if the local correlation is bounded, where here instead of having an arbitrary pair, I have an edge, um, then independent rounding will succeed. And so now everything comes down to relating local and global correlation. Okay, so so now uh, what we want to do is we want to show that uh, we can relate the local and global correlation at least in expanders using Shirley Adams moment oracles. Okay, so let me let me do a very, very quick aside on what would happen if I actually had a, a truthful oracle instead of a Shirali Adams oracle, which is locally truthful. So this is this is the this comes from the, the uh, work of Barack Rabender and Story, which introduces this global correlation rounding idea. So okay, this is exact this is exactly one of the spots where I don't want you to look at any of the parameters at all. But basically the point is that if I have a truthful oracle of degree two. Okay, then there's automatically some relationship between the global correlation and the local correlation. And the proof is, you can see that it's only a couple of lines. It's just a couple of straightforward matrix identities um, that you shouldn't try to absorb right now. But the point is that, you know, what this proof is crucially using is that if I look at the matrix of correlations, it's like a covariance matrix. And so it should be positive semi-definite, right? Because if I have a covariance matrix, uh, of, a, of a graph, it's, it's, it's a positive semi-definite matrix. And, and this is no longer true for local oracles like Shirali Adams. So this is kind of why this proof doesn't apply immediately. Well, okay. What do you mean by a covariance matrix of a graph? No, sorry, not of a graph, of a distribution. Just the, just the covariance matrix okay. of any distribution should be yeah. I, yeah, sorry, I, I just uh, misspoke. Okay, so so here's so here's our here's our kind of uh, main idea, right? So suppose that we have a graph where the spectral radius is small, like let's say that uh, the eigenvalues are bounded by epsilon. So what this means is that uh, rapid mixing of random walks, right? So so if I take a, a t-step random walk where uh, t depends on uh, epsilon and n then uh, I, I start from some, some vertex u0, I end up with some vertex ut, and u0 and ut will be distributed roughly like a uniformly random pair of vertices in the graph, right? So this is kind of like a bridge between the, the local and the global. Um, so so uh, here is kind of the, the crucial uh, lemma that we prove. So I'm gonna use this notation 
uh, I told the TJ to be a pair of vertices sampled by sampling first I according to the stationary measure uh, on the graph, or if you want to think about it, think about a, a regular graph and just sampling the vertex uniformly at random. Okay, and then I sample J by taking a T-step random walk from I. So this is a distribution over pairs of vertices in the graph. So our main lemma is that uh, if I have a D local mo moment oracle with a D lower bounded by this quantity, uh, two over delta squared, and if the T-step correlation is at least delta, then the two the T-step two correlation will be at least uh, half delta squared, right? So, so what, what are we gonna use this lemma to say? Uh, let's, let's first think of, about the simple step this case of, of local correlation where T is one, right? So that's just a, a uniformly random uh, edge in the graph uh, because I, I just sample a vertex and then I sample one of its neighbors in a one step uh, random walk. So this will say that if the local correlation is at least delta, then the two-step correlation is at least delta squared. And then the four-step correlation is at least delta to the four. And the eight-step correlation is at least delta to the eight, et cetera, right? And, uh, and, and the point is that we won't need to take our degree too large uh, because, because we're only ever going to be looking at these kind of local neighborhoods, but still we'll get a local to global uh, type of statement. I mean, will, will the uh, value of t, how will it, uh, you know, relate to the degree of the graph? Will you still, will you need that, uh, you know, uh, so t is logarithmic, is t is like, uh, like log n over log delta, roughly? Exactly, yeah. So basically you expect uh, to get to the uniform, you want to get to the uniform distribution. Yeah, we want to get close to the uniform distribution. I see. So for sparse graphs, you are not going to be able to do much, like constant no. degree graphs. Uh, right. So for constant degree graphs, we will, but we will still be able to get sub-exponential. Uh, oh, I see. Right? So, yeah, it's con if it's a very high constant, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think in general we have like n to the order log uh, one over delta uh, degree Shirley Adams relaxations. Okay. Yeah. And this, by the way, I mean, okay, so this is like a, a very, uh, very aside, but this is, this is the, this is actually the lower bound that Chari Karmakarchik and Karachuk shows for their uh, sparse graphs. So, so we get the tight solution for uh, sparse graphs, actually. Uh, okay, so how are, we, how are we going to prove this lemma? So we're going to use something that we decided to call a, a spider random walk. Okay, and um, the way this is gonna work is I'm going to sample uh, a subgraph of the graph as follows. So first I'm going to sample some random vertex according to the stationary measure. And then I'm going to take uh, K random walks each of length T from this vertex. So here's one walk of length T and I'll do this K times. Okay, so this is, this is a shape that I call a KT spider. It's just a generalization of, a generalization of, the, of a K star. Uh, and, and now uh, this gives me some distribution over subsets of graph, uh, subset, subsets of vertices of, of this graph. Um, so let's take Z to be the subset of uh, variables that I saw. Okay, and the cool thing about this is that uh, neighbors are distributed like independent edges in the graph. But um, as long as the paths have length at least t, then endpoints are actually distributed like independent samples from, from the graph. Okay, and this is what's gonna let me relate my local and global uh, properties. So this is like a pictorial representation, basically what I saw last time. But um, within this subset of variable z, we see both local and global correlations. Okay, so the proof of our main lemma is going to go uh, kind of like this. So what I'm going to do is I, I will think of a distribution where I randomly sample a KT spider in my graph using these uh, uh, random walks. Sorry, just about the assumption for the lemma. Uh, there is an assumption about the eigenvalue here. So it's less than... Well, this, in the, here the, here there's no... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just verifying that this is for an arbitrary graph, this statement, or for a graph whose eigenvalue is bounded by... This is for an arbitrary graph. So, so it will always be true that I can relate 
correlation of distance t to correlation of distance two t. And every the, the thing that matters is uh, will uh, as long as the degree you know is at least inverse the correlation at distance two t. And and the thing that the bound on the eigenvalues will let me is it will let me take d large enough uh, so that I can take you know the so I can take t large enough in order to get to the uh, log n over log delta uh, value, right? So. If if uh, um, just trying to the same. Suppose the graph was disconnected, and uh, um, you know taking a t random walk is the same distribution as taking a one step random walk. So it's a comp smaller complete graph disconnected from the rest. How can yeah, we do the correlation? We we cannot actually. I mean, in in a in a. Uh, I guess if the distribution of one step is the same as the distribution of two steps, then this is an empty statement, right? Because uh, like the local and the global correlation are equal within this piece. So, so okay, I, I guess the point is that this distribution, uh, these distributions depend on the graph as well, right? It's like the distribution of a pair sampled the distance t via random walk and the distribution of a pair sampled the distance yeah. 2t. Yes, yeah, so I'm yeah. just wondering in the case if the particular graph, these two expectations are the same, then you cannot get an amplification, right? Right, that's right. So how, but, but it seems like there is some. No, but I, I guess in those graphs, uh, oh, sorry, the, that means the, the values. The, the right hand side is smaller than the left. Uh, the, this yeah. Graph. Yeah, of course, of that, the square is, is lower, smaller than that. Yeah. Okay. yeah, 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 good. Sorry, sorry. yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's not an amplification, it's just saying that I don't lose too much when I go all yeah. the way out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so, okay, great. So, so I'm going to uh, sample a random spider in the graph. Uh, and now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the covariance matrix only of this spider itself, right? Okay, so, so, uh, so, Instead of looking at the covariance matrix of the entire graph, I'm going to look at this local covariance matrix only on the spider that I sampled, right? Uh, okay, it, it's going to it's going to uh, uh, look like this, and, and, and let me let me only look at the at, at kind of some uh, specific blocks of this matrix. So let's let's say that these guys uh, are all the last endpoints of the walk, right? And this guy is the, the root. Okay, so as long as K is less than D, where D was my Shirley Adams degree, then because Shirley Adams is a D local truthful moment oracle, it has to be the case that this is a positive semi-definite matrix. Right, so it's not it's not an n by n positive semi-definite matrix. It's just a k by k positive semi-definite matrix. Okay, and and so in particular, if I take the quadratic form with any uh, vector, this has to be non-negative. Right. Okay, so now what I do is I uh, I I will choose some specific vector, and I'll take this expectation uh, some some average here over spiders that I embed in my graph. Right and okay now if I look at this uh, resulting block matrix, so this green block here will give me the expected t step covariance right because this is the uh, expected uh, covariance between the root and uh, one of the endpoints of the random walk. Uh, on the diagonal I'll have the the you know the variances which are just um, like some quantity that's bounded by one. Okay, and then and then in this this green uh, block, I'll have the expected two t step covariance because that that's going to be like the covariance of two distinct endpoints of the random walk. So so in this little d by d positive semi definite matrix, I've managed to capture both the uh, expected t step covariance and the expected two t step covariance. All right, and now I'm going to just very cleverly uh, choose this this uh, vector v uh, in order to get an inequality that uh, I can solve in order to get this conclusion that I want. Right. So, but but basically, this I, I, we're we're saying that you know 
if the t-step covariance, this part of the matrix here, is large, then the two t-step covariance can't be too small in a positive semi-definite matrix. That's all. Um, so, so kind of like instead of working with the full n by n covariance matrix, like the semi-definite programming-based proofs do, we're working with these very local uh, small covariance matrices that that Shirley Adams is able to guarantee our PSD. Uh, but because we have a bound on the mixing time of our random walks, uh, this will end up being enough for us in order to get the kind of quantitative relationship that we wanted uh, to relate the local and the global correlation. Okay, so uh, here I think I imagined that we would be plugging in the parameters and like, you know, having an aha moment about how, how all that's gonna go, but let's, let's just skip it, I guess, hopefully the intuition for what's going on is uh, still clear. Okay, so, so uh, putting it together uh, in a graph of small spectral radius, if we have a high enough degree Shirley Adams relaxation, like uh, n to the uh, order one over log the degree, then we can round to a solution of objective value, objective minus 0.01. Okay, so uh, our steps are going to be like this. First, we're going to decrease the global correlation, right? Then we'll apply our local to global lemma to realize that the bound on the global correlation implies a bound on the local correlation, and then we'll use our independent rounding strategy to get the solution of the objective value. So that was that. Um, I guess here I, I'm not going to say much about going uh, beyond expanders. Uh, except that uh, basically what we'll do is we'll use these uh, prior results by Aurora Brock and Stoyer and then um, a, a variant uh, of Stoyer in 2011, which say that uh, if I have a graph or if I have any graph, then I can partition it into pieces where the threshold rank is small, meaning there aren't too many eigenvalues uh, that are too large. Um, without losing too many edges. So, so there's some way to take uh, my graph and decompose it into pieces so that every piece has small threshold rank uh, and at least a constant fraction of the edges in the graph remain inside the pieces. So at least a constant fraction are not cut by any partition. Um, we're able to uh, generalize our argument from before to work in not only in, in graphs that are completely pseudo random and, and have all of their eigenvalues bounded, but only have bounded threshold rank. So that's that's a, another uh, step. But then once we have that, then uh, what we will do is we will argue that within each piece in this threshold rank decomposition, the Shirali Adams value is going to be large. And uh, at least a constant fraction of the edges remain within the pieces. So uh, what we can do is we can round inside every uh, solution, every every chunk to get a, a solution of, of objective value reasonably close to one. Okay, and then what we'll do in order to get our global solution is we just apply a random signing to the solution in every chunk. So then uh, all the edges that cross the partitions are cut with probability half. So in total, we'll get the solution of value uh, at least half plus whatever the fraction is that remains inside each of the pieces. All right, so I think this was probably too fast to be uh, very clear, but but also it's uh, very much based on what already appeared in, in prior work, so. Okay, so, so that, that basically uh, concludes it. So, so uh, again, yeah, we're able to show that uh, sub-exponential size linear programs can get non-trivial approximations to MAMSCAT, uh, and we're also able to get this to work for some other discrete optimization problems, which I find uh, pretty surprising. This key insight was to get local and global correlation uh, to, to be related to each other via these kind of local uh, random walks and these small PSC matrices. Uh, let, me, let me say a couple of open uh, questions. So one, I think, interesting question is, uh, can we show that sub exponential linear pro programs can do well for uh, a couple of the regimes that we weren't able to capture? So 
one such what's this question is max cut gain. So say that I have a graph where the max cut value is pretty close to epsilon or to half, say it's, its value is half plus epsilon. So an analysis of Charikar and Worth show that the Gomez Williamson semi-definite program can be approximated up to half plus epsilon uh, over log one over epsilon. So even when the value is close to half, uh, the semi-definite program performs well. Okay, and uh, our analysis cannot show this result. So we lose a lot in this graph partitioning step, uh, but it's still plausible that the linear program does uh, certify a value that's close to optimal in, in this case. Um, yeah, I wonder, I wonder if that's true. Uh, similar questions in the, in the you know, very close to one uh, regime. Um, uh, yeah, another somewhat different question is, can we certify graph expansion with, with linear programs? Uh, like in the in the vein of uh, sparse cut, um, yeah. So that, I, I guess that that basically concludes the, the questions. Um, and uh, thanks so much for attending and listening. Yeah, thanks, thanks. All right, uh, questions, please. Anybody? Well, till you think of one. <laughs> so your your favorite, uh, I guess, challenge uh, here is the sparse cut. Is the uh, is the simplest uh, two CSP for which you you don't know if the LP works. Or what is yeah. the most natural uh, two two CSP for which you don't know that your LP works? I guess, I guess or, for or any, sorry, on a, or any LP of sub exponential size works. Yeah, I, I guess sparse is kind of is a, is a great, uh, is a great question. Um, but there, I guess there's, uh, there are even simple examples. So any, any, uh, CSV where, uh, the expected value plus epsilon is not a good approximation, uh, compared to what we know how to do. So our, our rounding technique, I mean, our techniques won't, won't work there, right? Because all of the edges that we cut in the partition, we sort of depend upon getting the uh, expected value on, on those. Um, so yeah, so, so somehow, somehow this, this like threshold uh, rank partitioning step is, is very unsatisfying. And um, there are many CSPs that it doesn't do well on. Uh, sparse is cut, I guess, should be one of them, yeah. Um, okay, more questions. Yeah, Tzlil, uh could you go back to the open question slide? So the first question. Um, so I'm I'm not very sure about max cut gain yet, but uh, so for for PSD growth and dig, right? The uh, X transpose A X where A is a PSD matrix. I think there's a linear sized um, reduction from from three set that shows that say pi over two is optimal. Um, and so this means that, you know, like you can't, you can't beat linear levels. You can't beat pi over two after linear levels. Now max cut gain, I kind of always thought as, um, sort of more of this X transpose AX question without the constant. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not sure yet, but yeah, I mean, it, it could potentially be that linear levels, um, are necessary. But what? Would that not, I mean, but there's a semi-definite programming and relaxation that gets a reasonable approximation. So like if, I mean, I guess, are you saying that the hardness comes from the reduction from three set? Because- uh, oh, oh, okay, good point, good point. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. My my claim is not valid here, yeah. For, yeah, since your question is about just beating what the basic LP, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just want, I just want to know if I can do something similar to what the, the SDP can do. Um, it's qualitatively, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So my claim would only apply to beating the basic STP or something with sub exponentially many levels. Um, uh, yeah, uh, and and so yeah. So another question was, uh, so like, what part of this program would you think uh, is the is the hardest to extend to the STP world? Let's say you want to beat 0.878 and get a sub exponential algorithm for max cut. 
Oh, I, th I guess I think none. Of, I don't know that anything that we come up with is useful for them. So, like all of this, like local to global stuff that we do, it's it's naturally true for the SDP, right? Like the SDP can already relate local and global correlation much better than the linear program can. So, mm -hmm. so everything we're doing is to get around not having the spectrohedral constraint. Um, and I don't know if there's really insights from from what we did that will. Um, yeah, that will allow us to improve the analysis of SDPs. Uh, there, yeah, I, I, so yeah, unfortunately, I, I guess all yeah. of it, <laughs> I don't know if any of it can be extended yet. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but do you happen to know, let's say, like why the Barak Raghavan, the Steuer strategy is not instantiable on Max Uh I guess it is in Max Cut of bounded threshold rank. So, okay. Yeah, and, and the, the point is that like when you do this partitioning into thresh into pieces of bounded threshold rank that, that we did, automatically you're losing a very, very large um, fraction of the edges in the graph. So you can't hope to get better than half plus epsilon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, I misunderstood the no, no, it's, yeah. Okay, more questions. I have one more. Uh, I just wonder, suppose what you want to do is just approximate the second largest eigenvalue of the graph. What, uh, I mean, sem semi-different program will give you all the eigenvalues, so that's no problem. What can you do with a linear program? It seems yeah, that somehow a... it's uh, essential to what you do. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the heart of what you do. It's, uh, um, you know, what is the second eigenvalue either of the graph or it's, you know, some partitioning of it. Um, that's essential to your uh, um, local to go global trick. Yeah, I, I think that, I think, so this is a great question as well. And the issue is that the Shirali Adams linear program is tailored to the case where you have some discrete optimization problem, like optimization problem over discrete variables. This is the only reason that you only have a bounded number of events in your uh, local probability spaces. And that's why you can encode this as a finite uh, LP, right? And the moment that you start asking about the second eigenvalue of the whole graph, you know, I don't know what the, I mean, like the local approximations that I have to do are little local, um, like semi-definite programs or something. I mean, it, it's not, it, I guess I don't know how to formulate this as a linear relaxation, uh, or I don't know the correct hierarchy for this anymore. Yeah, there are, uh, you know, some of the proofs of, uh, well, yeah, I don't know if it's relevant. I mean, you can you can basically uh, approximate it by by uh, you know epsilon net, right? I mean, it's, uh, yeah, you can look at an epsilon net on the ball, and there are more more refined ways if you really want to get close to the second eigenvalue. But you can make it a finite problem. It, it will not be the the cube, but it will be some epsilon net on the ball on the sphere that in all the right to discreetly approximate the second eigenvalue. That but can, but this. But the constraint, I mean, but then the constraint that the L2 norm of the entire vector is bounded by one is very important. But I think that you would, um, it would be tricky to capture that with these local hierarchies. Um, I think all these points will be on the sphere. They are uh, like the points of the cube. They will be, you know, like. Well, I, I mean, I guess the, the problem is that the feasible region allows you to zero out uh, n minus d coordinates and put all of your L2 mass on d coordinates. And so I think that I, I like I, I think that you would have a some some factor of n uh, loss from from doing this. I mean, you on any on any like local subset of d points, you have to include a sphere of radius um, larger than you'd normally. Yeah, I see. Okay, well, I, yeah, it seems like uh, I, I need to think more about this question, what it means. But I see, I, I see your point. Yeah. More questions to three. Yeah, one last thing. I mean, would it be correct to summarize part of the insight in in this as uh, as as that you don't actually need to find the second eigenvalue, the global second eigenvalue of a graph. You only need to look at 
the eigenvalues of these local matrices? Yeah, I think so. It, that sounds like a good uh, encapsulation to me. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, really nice talk, by the way. Yeah, I, love, I really like it. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any more? All right, Slir, thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Really nice to see everyone also.